All right, we have a multi-step problem here where we are given a wall that has uh, a left-hand coordinate at negative 0 0.25 meters and a right-hand coordinate of 0 0.15 meters for a total width of 0.4 meters. We're told that we have the wall is made of a ceramic, so we can go onto our tables and look up values such as the uh, thermal conductivity of that material. We're then told that we have a temperature distribution and we see that it's quadratic. So the quadratic either means that it's, since it's a one dimensional wall, the quadratic is going to either tell me that there's some Q dot present in the wall or that it's not steady state, right? Those would be the only two situations that we've looked at right now where you would get a nonlinear temperature distribution throughout the wall. All right, so that being said, we're given some information here uh, about different constants. So we have A equaling 200 degrees Celsius, B, which is the linear co constant, and C, which is the constant for the quadratic term. Now, if you, when you're given something like this, you've essentially made, uh, you're essentially plotting data that someone's collected. And in this particular case, the data has been collected as degrees centigrade. So you just can't arbitrarily take something that has a nonlinear dependency and then just arbitrarily add 273 degrees to them to convert these to Kelvin. And there's no need for that. We're asked to sketch the temperature distribution and include whatever details. Basically, we need to know what the curve looks like for us to move through the rest of the problem. So in this particular case, we have information about the coordinate at the left-hand wall, which is negative 0.25, and information about the right-hand wall, and also, of course, if x equaling 0, which, since we're going from negative 0.25 to 0.15, 0 is inside the wall. So that gives us three points. We have negative, uh, sorry, 178 degrees. This should be degrees Celsius. Uh, 222 degrees Celsius and 200 degrees. So if you curve has to be upwards or concave up rather because you have a plus x squared. If you're not sure if there's a local maximum within the uh, local max or min, you take your derivative and we take the derivative of this function and then we set it equal to zero and we find that it's not zero anywhere within the wall. It's at negative 0.43. So there's no local maximum or minimum. All right, so the second part of this problem says, let's determine the heat fluxes that are entering or leaving through the wall and indicate the directions of these. So this is the expression of Fourier's law for a heat flux. And not a lot, but there's still a few people that think that dt dx is always delta T delta X, which of course is not the case. You have an expression for temperature as a function of X. So when you're applying Fourier's law, you have to take the derivative, which we've already taken up here as being 290 X plus 125. So we do that for the left-hand wall, and we plug in negative 0.25, and I get an expression that my heat flux is negative 209 watts per meter squared. So if I look up here, here is positive x. So if I have a negative heat flux at this location, it is pointing in the negative x direction. So what we find out is that this is Q flux out. So there's an outward flow of heat through the left-hand wall of this part, of this wall. Then we look at the right-hand side. So Q on the right-hand side, where our value is 0.15. And again, we end up with a value that's negative. So we go up and again take a look at our coordinate system. And in this case, negative is still pointing to the left. But in this case, we have a Q flux that's in. So we have 671 watts per square meter coming into the wall and 209 watts per square meter leaving the wall. And you can see that the values are quite different, but you can also tell that by looking at the slopes here. The slope of this curve is 
fairly shallow where the slope of this curve is fairly broad. So you'd expect that since the heat rate is proportional to the slope of the curve, that you're expecting this Q in or the heat flux on the right hand wall to be considerably greater, which indeed we do find out to be the case. All right, so the next part of this question said, right, with the problem statement doesn't tell you whether you're steady state or if you have a Q dot. So if you're not, if it's not steady state or if there's a Q dot. So in part C, it says if the temperature distribution is steady state. So if it's steady state, the only way you can get some sort of quadratic temperature distribution is by the fact that there must be some heat generated within the wall. Or, as we'll find, some heat being taken out of the wall. So what you need to do in a situation like this is you're using conservation of energy. In this case, in all the heat transfer things we're looking at, it's conservation of thermal energy. So written like this, these are the heat rates, and again remember, this means joules per second, right? E the energy is joules, and it's a rate, so it's joules per second. So we have the amount of energy that's flowing in minus the amount of energy flowing out, plus whatever is generated has to add up to being zero. Otherwise, if it didn't, we would have energy the, the total amount of energy within the wall changing as a function of time and that would not be steady state. So we're given in, in joules per second which is watts but we're doing it on a flux basis so we need to make sure that we're watts per square meter so in that particular case we have our Q in, we have Q out and then heat flux or heat generated our Q dot is being defined as watts per cubic meter because it's a volumetric heat generation rate. So to get the flux value, we say we don't care what the total area distribution of the wall is, right, this portion here, we only want to know it on a per unit, unit area basis, so we need to know how thick the wall is. So we need to divide through by that value to get the, to get the total heat flux um, or the amount of energy that needs to be generated to accommodate these heat fluxes. So we go back up to our diagram and we see that we have 209 watts per square meter leaving the wall and I have 671 watts per square meter coming into the wall. So clearly the amount of energy that's, uh, so we find out that we have more energy coming in than we have energy going out. So instead of a heat flux generating heat, we need something to suck the heat away, essentially. This has to be a sink, call it a refrigerator, as opposed to a source. So that's what we're expecting. We're expecting a negative number. So indeed, when we do this, we get 209 minus 671 divided by the thickness of the wall, and we get that we have a volumetric heat generation or volumetric heat uh, removal of 1,154 watts per cubic meter. So that's where that negative sign is, that we're absorbing energy per unit volume. All right, so now this, the last part of this problem says, consider a situation where Q, that should be Q dot, equals zero, and the temperature distribution represents an instant in time. So now we're in a non-steady state situation. And we have an expression for what, how the heat changes in a one-dimensional plane wall for all types of conditions, steady or non-steady, uh, Q dot or non-Q dot, and that is the 1D heat equation. So we have the second derivative of the temperature distribution, and that equals material properties of the 
of the wall itself and times the time rate of change of the temperature field. So again, what we're looking at here, of course, is that we have now temperature as a function of x and t. That's why these partial derivatives are showing up. So, but since we're just asked, what's the rate at which temperature is changing? We just need to evaluate this term. So we were given the temperature distribution at that instant in time as being t as a function of x. We've already taken the derivative of it, which is this value here, and now we need to take the second derivative of it. So I'm basically taking ddt, which I'm over here, multiplying through by k rho c sub p, this term, and I'm just taking the second derivative. And we find out that the second derivative is constant. It just becomes 290. So my answer is that the time rate of change of the temperature, dt, the time rate of change of the temperature as a function of time, is 290 Kelvin per meter squared times the uh, thermal conductivity divided by essentially the thermal capacitance, right? 206, 2600 kilograms per cubic meter times 808 joules per kilogram. And again, uh, sometimes I see that people do not bother working all the way through the units. It's helpful. So we have Kelvin per meter squared, watts per meter per Kelvin, and we're dividing through, so essentially multiplying through by cubic meters per kilogram, and then a kilogram Kelvin joule. Cancel all your terms out, right? The, the Kelvins cancel. Where's my Kelvin down here? My cubic meters cancel, and my kilograms cancel. And I am left with a Kelvin here, and a watt here, and a joule here. So I come down here and I say, well, wait a minute, that's not exactly what I want, but then I recognize that a watt is a joule per second, cancel with the joules, and I end up with my Kelvin per second, which indeed are the proper units that you need for the time rate of change of the temperature. So we end up with that, we have a fairly small time rate of change, but we note that it is positive, so the temperature in the wall is increasing. Okay, so which makes sense over here that if I would turn off this negative energy sink that the, we would have more energy coming into the wall, 671 watts per square meter, uh, than we would have leaving and the temperature in the wall would have to increase.